and I don't, we don't necessarily have to redo that, but um, if, if you know that you didn't put down an email last year in 2013 at some time, on the prayer list, just down on the, maybe on the, the bottom right, write down your name and email address so that I can get Kathy to add that to it. Uh, and the reason why is that's just the best way for us to communicate. Uh, and I know not everybody uh, favors uh, emails, um, but at least that's a good way that we can start getting the word out if there is something that needs to be communicated uh, amongst this group here. Uh, I, I remember when I put that down in my mail. Well, I'll tell you what, if you received an email, um, let's see, today is the 14th. You should have received an email around the 5th or the 4th of the new year that said we're starting back on the 7th. So if you did not get that email, then we do not, we do not have your email in our file. And uh, so it's just a way, whenever we take breaks, or if there's going to be a week that we're not meeting, or if there's something that comes up in the form of a prayer request from, from one Tuesday to the next Tuesday, it's just an easy way for us to kind of do a shotgun approach to, uh, to get the word out. So if you have not received an email from Kathy Holland, about the Tuesday morning Bible study in 2014, we do not have your email. Let me say it that way. Does that sound good? Just some, in some way, on the prayer pad, you put it on the front, the back, just something that says, hey Shane, here's my email, please add me to it. Uh, if you don't email, and you would rather us call you, uh, and we can do that too. So, all right. Um, a couple of uh, other FYIs. Um, last week, I know uh, we had a uh, we did some preliminary work on the background of First Corinthians. I have a few of the slides. Um, I can easily print some more. But if you need some at the break, uh, if you will just come see me, and we can make sure that you get those. Those are very helpful in in setting the stage for context. Uh, also, um, normally, Slade, what is it, maybe around Thursday or so, we put up the following this, weeks. This one right here. Yeah, we will just go up on the website. It'll go up to sometime. To, it'll be up in the morning. Okay. Yeah. So each week, if you miss it or sure. something wasn't clear and you want to get uh, some, <laughs> some insight or, or to maybe just hear it again, uh, you can go on our website. If you just look for, um, it'll just say audio, visual, click it, and it's got all the things from Sundays to Revelation study that we just completed a few weeks ago to this Bible study to a Bible study that John's doing, and you can just click on it, and it, it immediately comes up. So um, They do not hang anymore. They are come through YouTube. So right, right. It's a totally different system if you hadn't been on it. You should take a look at it for sure. It's real it's really nice. And friendly. All you have to do is push one button now yeah. instead of ten buttons. Yeah. And so uh, we try to take out all the preliminary steps where you just kind of... I, I like to, to push the screen, and then when I push it, I want it all to work. And so that's kind of what we're going on. <laughs> and so uh, we're, we're getting close to that. All right, uh, just a couple of brief announcements. Um, some of you have heard, um, you don't have to be a part of St. Paul, but if you want to piggyback with us, you can. On, on January 26th, uh, we're going to have lunch out at the National uh, Infantry Museum and then watch that uh, IMAX 45-minute um, uh, movie on Jerusalem. Uh, so if you're interested in that, just contact Kathy on your way out. And a place. That's what I mean. Uh, on Wednesday, we're about to start a new study that's based from a, a pretty good minister named John Ortberg. Uh, and it's called When the Game is Over, It All Goes Back in the Box. That'll be Wednesday after supper. Uh, I put youth ski trip mainly to pray for me. I'm going. And, uh, <laughs> we leave on Friday. And, um, when, you know, I fancy myself as a 25 year old man. My body's not. And so maybe mentally I think I can ski this way, and physically I probably can't. We have a, uh, it's, all, it's full, and we have a number of youth that are going. And uh, it should be a wonderful trip, but uh, I have, uh, I'm, I'm going as well. Uh, and then Mary Boyd has a quick announcement. I just wanted, oops, oops. Uh, I just wanted to thank everybody that supported Lucy and her bake sale to raise money, and she wrote you all a note. 
She said, Dear Mamie's Bible Study, <laughs> I'd like to thank you for your support in my fundraising project for the Juvenile, Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation in honor of my brother Ed. With your help, we are sending JDRF $1,219. Tell her anytime she wants to cook, uh, <laughs> at least on the staff side of it, we, we enjoy the cake and a pie. So uh, we, we'll be happy to uh, keep this ongoing fundraising deal available well, you, as long as she's willing. You know, so. um, there was one other announcement. Um, many of you grew up and remember uh, T.P. Kerbin. Uh, he and Paul. And uh, I think that all the boys are coming in. It should, should be a, a wonderful time for their family to be together, but at the same time, a, a sad time in, in November and Tiffany. So 11 o'clock this coming Saturday here at St. Paul. Okay, any other announcements that uh, that we might need to mention that y'all know of? Uh, Shane, just that uh, Lindsay is getting her Yesterday. Sinus infection. So my left side, if you're speaking over here, shout. And if you're over here, I can hear you. But over here, I, I, if I look like a deer in the headlights, it's because I vaguely can hear what's going on. Six-month checkup, Lindsay Layfield. Right. Lindsay Layfield, six-month checkup, uh, getting the results back today you know, from, from the Mayo Clinic. All right. What about Andy? Uh, I saw trip yesterday. Uh, there, I mean, as for where they're at, it's the best that it can be. Um, he has sensation in all parts of his body, uh, good blood flow in all parts of his body. He's doing, uh, he's in his, I guess what they call the off week in the chemo. Uh, and so what the, his schedule is, he will go and do chemo for a week or so, and then he'll go back to Houston for rehab. And so he's about to, to be transported back to Houston for a week of rehab. Um, you know, what the doctors have assured, uh, they, they are expecting him to have full recovery when it comes, but it's just a long time. They can't dictate the when it'll be. And, uh, but they are very optimistic. Let me, let me say it to you that way. More of a marathon than a sprint. Um, and, you know, now one of the things that just in, with illnesses like this, you know, normally when there's a diagnosis, there's that high time of where, where, it, where it's just, uh, a fair amount of anxiety, a fair amount of a crisis, and so everybody amps up for everything that's going on. But then, when there's a long recovery, you kind of go through the mully grubs, you know. And, and so, if I would guess, at some point, if Andrew is is responding the way all of us would, that's going to be more of an issue. Because uh, I mean, think about our own patient level. I can't imagine, my son's 14, same age as he is, you know, his level of patience, you know, would be, I can do whatever I want, why can't I get up and immediately start running again? And so, uh, probably at some point going forward, one of the, not just the physical recovery, but the recovery that's based around, this is a long-term recovery process, and, and where he'll probably have to learn to walk again, you know, and all things that, that, that entails, you know, from the learning just to move, and then, because um, right now he can't, still can't move his legs. And uh, but he does have all the, all the indications are that we're, there, the doctor, it's, it's going exactly the way the doctors would want it to be. And, uh, but we'll have to go through the whole process of learning to walk again. So, uh, you know, so that, you know, you can, but uh, I spent the afternoon with Trip, and, and, you know, so far I think they feel, very blessed, all things considered, and appreciate all the love and care for people. And if you're not on their Care and Bridge uh, part, uh, page, I think he tries to write about every three days or so to kind of give updates and uh, you know continue to pray for them and, and for you know the, uh, George and, and Wesley and just everybody that's involved. Uh, Big George had surgery, I think hip surgery uh, yesterday, and uh, did did well so, so far. So good. All right, any others? Okay. Well, let's pray and then we'll begin uh, actually with some of the text. Oh so God, again, as we gather in your name, we give thanks for your grace and your mercy. Uh, we give thanks that you've called us into community. And it's not just that we find a sense of wholeness in, in being with you, but we that, that gets elevated. 
and it, it becomes cemented when we're in community and when we are with each other and where it's it's amazing how we can love through you love each other in the wholeness and and so in whatever part that this group can play in that inside of our lives and inside of the lives that we touch if there are things that need to take place inside of us so that we uh, can grow uh, in wholeness or if there's things that that need to take place inside of us so that we can aid in somebody else's growth uh, that's ultimately what we want to happen uh, from from being together um, we want to learn we want to grow uh, we want to in some degree uh, or fashion um, have our life reflect Jesus Christ uh, to others to our own families to the world uh, and so all this we give to you at this time in the name of Christ. Amen. Okay, a little recap about uh, Corinth. <clears throat> the church is, you know, all, all the communities that you find in the New Testament are real communities. Uh, 1 Corinthians is a book that really addresses the realness of the church. It, it's in a city that um, has the best and worst of a society. Um, it has great wealth, it has great art, it has, you know, it's advancement for people. Uh, anything that you can think of on the positive side, they have it. And everything that is the underbelly of a society, they have that too. And, uh, and so naturally, if that's the context or the larger pond by which the church lives in, people who are drawn to the church, uh, what doesn't happen is, is we get perfect and then we come to church. Does that make sense? I mean, I would like to think that that's the way it works. But it does. And so, whatever the surrounding culture is, it has a tendency to, to, to become part of the church. And, and so, and what you have with Paul is Paul starts the church around 52 AD. A few years later, he's starting another church in, in Ephesus. Uh, the people at Corinth are really, they're just imploding on each other. And uh, because of all this stuff that they're having worked out. And uh, so they write to Paul. They get insight on some aid of what's going on. And so in Corinthians, more so than the other books of the New Testament, follow a laundry list of topics. And this is kind of the breakdown of the book. Uh, you know, the first four chapters or so, you have the introdu introduction. Uh, it's a typical introduction to Paul. Lots of theology in it, in a small amount of words. And... But to about chapter 4, Paul is really dealing with this idea of authority because one of the key issues, and probably the most dominant issue for the Corinth church, it is that it has a number of fractions that are vying for authority. And some of them are trying to base it on seniority and tenure. Some are trying to base it on their theology. Some are trying to base it on uh, gifts. I mean, you know, just anything that can be... And so over these four chapters, he's addressing the concept of unity and how that plays into uh, you know, people's authority, leaders' authority, what's the ultimate authority for a church. Chapter 5, it's a very specific issue. There is a person in the church, actually a couple in the church, that are leaders that, uh, where people have tried to, to correct some behavior and it has not worked, and it's gotten to a point where it's causing all kinds of problems, and Paul addresses it head on. It's a very difficult chapter to read. The language in it is very harsh. Uh, chapter 6, the beginning, one of the other issues is uh, they were the church people were taking each other to court every single day over petty stuff. He addresses that. Um, now, when we get around 6, 9 to around the end of chapter 10, it sits in a larger issue of this whole physical body, spiritual implications uh, around different contextual issues of the day. Uh, that what, 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 what do we mean by Christian freedom? What's this whole mixture between physical and spiritual when it comes to relationships? And at the same time, this whole physical and spiritual uh, dynamic or dichotomy that shows up in worship, particularly in pagan worship, or uh, or is idolatry uh, is probably what's would be the the uh, a similar topic by using the Old Testament language. In chapter eleven through fourteen, he addresses the issue around worship. In the beginning, it has to do with uh, 
um, male and female relationships, male and female leadership when it comes to worship. Uh, in chapter 12, 13, and 14, he's dealing specifically with uh, gifts and how the Holy Spirit is involved in that. And then the last subject has to do, uh, in chapter 15, has to do with issues around uh, the resurrection. And so, you know, so what, what we conclude, or at least deduce, is that there's a group of people who wrote to Paul and said, we need help with these issues. And Paul just tackles them as if they're just the, the grocery list. Okay, number one, unity. Well, I know about the context. Let me give you some insight into that. Let me weigh in. Next issue's here. Let me weigh in here. And it's just, I mean, um, did any of y'all do your homework? Let me start. And that was supposed to do as a teacher. All right. Uh, and what was the homework? Read it out loud without stopping. Could you see the breaks? Or read, or read one through four, yeah, uh, without stopping. And you got stuck on chapter three? That's right. We'll, we won't get to chapter three today, I promise you that. Dude. But, uh, but when we get to chapter three, it'll all be real crystal clear. So uh, uh, kind of like the problem of pain. And, uh, but um, if you read through it all without stopping, um, you, you probably could see the break when you left chapter 4 and went to chapter 5, because it told, the language changes, the theme changes, it, it changes a great deal from 5 to 6. And so, uh, it, it, by reading out loud, it focuses you to, you have to, you have to read every word, and, and you're reading it twice. You're reading it, uh, you know, kind of just the way we would read when we don't, when we don't uh, read out loud. And at the same time, you're hearing it, and so it's a, it's a way of slowing down enough to catch every word. And so, good on you. That's uh, fantastic. And um, so, all right. Uh, well, this is this is a sort of background. Now, what's key to the book of Corinthians, more so than some of the other books in the New Testament, because uh, some of the other books are, are heavy, heavy in theology, uh, and so you know, Paul is basically like uh, Romans, for instance. Romans, Paul is just writing his doctrine of salvation. Now, there's some contextual issues, but he doesn't know the city of Rome. He doesn't know the church of Rome. He's never been there. When you get to the end of the book of Romans is when he finally says, I really want to go here someday. <laughs> All right, you know, so I'm writing. I'm kind of giving you my, you know, here's my hundred pages on what I believe about God and Jesus and salvation. So when I get there, at least we'll be on the same page. Uh, but he, but he, he doesn't know the context. Here, he knows the context intimately. I mean, he's very familiar with the people. He's very familiar with the situations that are going on uh, inside this congregation. And so uh, when he's writing, so much of it has to deal with, uh, you have to see the context. Because it, uh, if, if you don't know the context in 1 Corinthians, you can walk down some, um, some paths that can be, uh, uh, can be more destructive than it can be helpful. Um, and and we, the history of the church is, is filled with some of this. And, uh, you know, for instance, um, you know, particularly when we get to right here, uh, worship, chapter 11, certain dress for males, certain dress for females. You know what they are? How many of y'all still dress that way? You're in violation of First Corinthians. I mean, you know, so, uh, you know, so I'm talking about, I mean, you know, uh, have, you know any of y'all ever have, this is a little bit off the topic, but it's, it's, it's worth it. Um, uh, old Methodist disciplines. Now, for those that, that aren't involved with the Methodist Church, our history, our theology, our case law is, is, is held in the Book of Discipline. And every four years, the global church meets and they hash out whatever it is they're going to hash out, and then they, then they print out the new discipline. And it, it, it might change, you know, half a percent, you know, of, of the information. But, but it does, there's some tweaks all along every four years. Go, if you can get your hands on some disciplines that are like uh, middle 1800s to, and then like read what's going on in the 1900s, early 1900s, and then particularly around social issues, about how much makeup, how long your hair, should you dance, should you not dance, can you play cards, can you not play cards. Um, you know, one of the things that Wesley did not want his, his uh, preachers to do was to play cards. 
And you know why? Idle time. Why would you want to waste a day playing cards? Well, obviously, we don't, you know, you know the cards, how many of y'all play cards? I mean, so, uh, we're not good methods, right? So Wesley was not approved. Um, but it's interesting to see. Now, the reason why I'm talking about that is not that, that, that that's, you know, one level we read it and it's a, it's a little bit of a chuckle. And, but at the same time, what, what the teaching is, what's the context of the day? What's the principle that gives us insight for how we are to apply our faith in the context? Does that make sense? And it doesn't mean that it changes, but you might have an eternal principle, but if the context changes, the way that's applied might look differently. Does that make sense? And so, uh, and so you have to you have to know the context of First Corinthians more so. Now this is this is thus say a shame. Okay, so don't you know, you can, John will probably say something else or whatever. Um, if you don't know the context, particularly this book. It, it can it can get to, into some quagmire, and uh, uh, more so than some of the others. And um, it, but it, it's it's interesting. But this but I like the book of First Corinthians because boy, this if there's ever is a snapshot of you know real life. You got it here. I mean, we, we talked last week about um, uh, this is this is some of the issues that were were, were the Corinth church was struggling with. Um, they developed a, a high sense of religious pride. There was all type of uh, uh, immorality. Uh, a great deal of that revolved around sexuality. There was uh, a great deal of conflicts over personal or over personalities and leadership. Now, uh, think about what happens in churches. Now, I don't know if you studied this. This is you know something I, I look at all the time. So often when churches split. It's, it's not over theology. You know what it's over? Personalities. And so Corinth is right there. Um, what are we supposed to do? How we handle our disagreements? Because I know nobody in the church ever disagrees. Um, that, uh, that now there are some theological fractions going on in the church. They had worship issues. Again, that's, a, that's an everyday occurrence, it seems. There were economic class issues that plagues the church throughout history and time. Uh, people were confused about their roles in church. What was, you know, what what it should be, what it should not be. Uh, there was all types of uh, wonders about what we really mean when we talk about resurrection. There was this uh, big concern over how does the spiritual and the physical uh, relate to each other. Now, of those things I just mentioned, how many of those do not apply to us today? Any of them? I mean, do you ever wonder about? Physical, spiritual, how that's connected. Uh, you know, if you hear people say mind, body, spirit, well, I mean, what's what? And you know, what what when we talk about resurrection, it talks about a body being resurrected. Uh, I mean, it, it, what does that mean? You know, um, uh, you know, what does it mean when we do things? You know, if we do things physically, do they have spiritual implications? Or consequences and vice versa if you do certain things spiritually does that affect you physically you know th these are real issues that are uh, that were, were issues in the current church and they're definitely issues for us so all right enough about the context now let's get into the text and, and we'll, we'll kind of go through it if uh, if I can get somebody to read uh, 1st Corinthians uh, chapter 1 1 through 3 <coughs> you did or did not pass around the slides for today? We do have uh, 40 something slides that were we printed. Have not, um, have they have they not, have not made it. Okay. Uh, who does not have one? Just so at break I can get some. Alright, I'll uh, hang on just one second. I think I can print them here. Okay. Are they going around? Are 
getting some more. Okay. Okay. Uh, Does that get here since the first? And they, nobody okay, uh, we're, we just bring some more, and uh, I will uh, get that those in just a second. Um, That's a different Okay. I, I will at the break. What I need is uh, if when we break, if you'll tell me how many people, if, how many need something last week, I can get them both so that we start back. Uh, and we're going to break pretty close to 10.30. So, so some of you who are real good at keeping time, raise your hand and uh, let me know when it's close to 10.30. And we'll take a break for 10 minutes. And I'll have this week's slides and next week's slides for those that need it. Uh, one more time. It's not quite the yeah, I'm going to take a hand count before we break. That's the last thing we're going to do before we break is get an idea of how much I need for each one. So, um, but the good thing about uh, one through three is this is a typical introduction from Paul. And so it, it's, it's weighted theologically around some certain issues that never go away and are vital for us to understand when it comes to our work identity. And so let's look at 1 through 3 real quick. So if somebody would read, <clears throat> excuse me, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. I'll read it. All right, go ahead. Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be holy, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Uh, Sosthenes. That's the name. Sosthenes. That's the name, isn't it? I mean, it is now. Yeah, it? I mean, uh, <laughs> how many name your children that? Just, uh, so, anyways, um, there's some interesting things that are important for us. One, he, he labels in the very beginning this idea to the church of God that is in Corinth. Now, from what we just talked about with this community, uh, it, would, it, it would seem on one level those wouldn't be the words that we would describe, the church of God. Um, uh, but yet he does, which is in, in, important. Uh, when we start to think about this whole concept of you know, another thing I guess we could put, we've talked about this in the past, you know, the whole concept of, of sinner versus saints, that we're, 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 we kind of live in both camps. You know, we're, we are sinners, and yet at the same time, God sees us at saint, as saints, uh, which is interesting uh, when you think about it. Um, at, you know, at the same time, um, with all the issues that are going on, you know, he, he doesn't say to the local congregation that's in the South Georgia Conference in Columbus called Corinth. And yet, when we think about church, well, for instance, when I say, where do you go to church? What are you going to say? Say, God. Well, not everybody here, but yeah, that's a good answer. Say it again real loud. <laughs> uh, but, you know, we think this is what church is, right? And that's okay, it's a local congregation. But, you know, just as there's, again, there's this the dichotomy, this, this balancing act of where we are a local congregation, but as God sees us, it's probably not as St. Paul United Methodist Church. God sees us just part of the church. And if you attend worship services that use creeds, and about, you know, there, there are a couple of denominations that don't, they are a creedal Church, they just don't use creeds in worship. If you have, if you believe in something, then you have a creed. And uh, you know the, the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed. You, you know, I, I believe in the Catholic small C, it means universal. Um, I, I believe in the church that is under God. When we, if we ever do a study on Colossians, when you get to chapter, it's either in the middle of chapter one or the middle of chapter two, uh, Paul actually quotes uh, what this, this theological poem that was used in the early church about who Jesus is. And one of the things that it says is that you know, he, he is the head of the church. And so the idea is you know, what, that even though we, and this person, this group would have thought local congregation too. Okay? So even though we are a part of the local congregation, 
and we serve in a local place because that's our context. That's a great thing. But not at the expense of forgetting or failure to see the larger picture that all churches, whether they be Methodist, Baptist, AOG, or whatever, sit under God. And Jesus is the head. Now, again, one of the issues that plagued the, the, the church at Corinth was fighting for authority. I mean, what's one of the temptations of being the authority figure? Yeah, well, you're in charge, power, uh, and you can also dictate policy, right? So if uh, you know, if I want to bash my, you know, both my brothers attend different denominations. One of my brothers attends uh, a church here in Columbus that's part of the uh, uh, Assemblies of God, and the other one uh, attends, and they're very, both of them are very active in their churches uh, in a Baptist uh, church. And, you know, of course, I'm a pot stirrer. Y'all have already figured that out about me. And so whenever we, we, different times of the year, we have a lot of family dinners on Sunday nights. And uh, so I like to stir the pot. And so often I like to stir the pot theologically around our differences just to, to kind of get at my brothers more than anything else. And, uh, but, you know, fun aside, what happens when we're not just trying to joke with each other, what happens when what we really want to do is tell the others who's in charge? You, you know what's tragic about the Protestant Reformation? And for some of y'all that were in the Wednesday night study about a year ago, we looked at Christianity's faith, family tree. Once there is a re Reformation, it never stops. And so when you look at the tree of Christianity, <coughs> It is splintered. And so often it has come on the backs and the blood of people who have died. Now, sometimes there are good reasons to reform. Doesn't mean that reform is bad. But there's always a part of every split or every reformation where we the pendulum swings so far in a direction that it 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 it, it doesn't even look like God. Uh, I wrote a paper on an Anabaptist reformer coming out of the Protestant Reformation by the name of Thomas Mutzer. You ever heard of him? <coughs> you ever heard of? Uh, he, he was involved in a peasant uh, revolt that Luther eventually had to call the princes and the leaders to put down because they were destroying people of different denominations. Mm -hmm. And they would descend upon a village and they would kill them all. And then they would go to the next village and they would kill them all. And they were doing it under the name of Jesus. And so when we read this, even though this is a typical introduction from Paul, to the church in Columbus, to the church in Corinth, of God. See also what it what it really means. That there's, you know, we want to be involved in local context. That's exactly what they are. They're, they're involved in their local congregation. But it's never at the expense of uh, <clears throat> losing the fact that you live inside of God's kingdom. Now, we, we looked at Mark last year, so the Gospels are full of this kingdom language, more so than church language. We don't really get church language until we get to the epistles. And in the Gospels, it talks about it, the idea of kingdom language. And so if you think back to your history lessons or, you know, uh, the idea of hinterland, you know, uh, the, my kingdom is here. And, you know, and, and so if you think of it in terms of geography, if you live under the king or under the ruler, you know, or whatever it may be, uh, if you live inside of the kingdom, you, you operate according to, to the rules of the kingdom. You, you live according to its dynamics. You, you, and, there, and there is someone who's, who's the authority figure. And it's not the inhabitants. It's the ruler. And there are times inside the congregation, local congregations, we, we, we forget that. 
And so it's, it's you know, if you, if you move so far in one direction where you just say, you know, I'm not involved in any local congregation because it's, it's all esoteric, it's up here, you know, I belong to the kingdom, uh, then, then you, you miss out on local ministries, hands-on, be, being salt and light. But if you get so far over here, at the expense of, of what the larger view is, I mean, do you see how you can walk down uh, the, these different trails that if you, if you buy, if you, if you move so far in one, this, one direction, you, you just retreat from everything. But if you get so far in this direction over here, then it's only you and everybody else doesn't matter. Does that make sense? And that happens. Oh, read the church history. I mean, you know, it is, and it's, it's uh, the church is filled with times where, you know, the masses, maybe for a 10, 15, 20, sometimes 50 year period, will move over here and then they'll, they'll move back over here. And, and there's, you know, in the middle where you, where you have a healthy context of knowing that you are here, but yet you're also over here too. That's, that's the message of, of what Paul is trying to remind. And he does this with every single congregation he writes to. You're describing the Republican Party. Uh, how's that? The Republican Party? Because they're here and there? I mean, you've got to help me out on that one. Uh, I'm not up to date with the theology around the Democrats or the Republicans. So, uh, yeah. yes, ma'am. Well, when you were talking about the guy that, or when they would go in and kill everybody in the very Right. Well, I could look it up, but I don't want to miss that much of what you've got to say. But it, what, where is it that where God told somebody to kill everybody, and they didn't? They left some cows and some people. All right, now that, the, the, Thomas Munzer is not in the Bible. You're talking about an Old Testament That's reference right. that has to do with everything. But whatever. I mean, couldn't he have been thinking? And they well, and it's God proved it is. Uh, yeah, but see, you got to also see the context from the whole conquest, right? So, I mean, you, you can't get away from context. Um, for Munzer, there was no context. You were brought out into the, into the square if you did not profess a, a certain means of baptism and you were not willing to renounce the Pope and you were not willing to buy into the, uh, some of Luther's writings and theological statements, they, they executed you right then. And so it was like Inquisition. And, but it was done in the name of we're, 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 we're doing what is right. I mean, they had the idea of doing what for everybody. Listen, everybody thinks they're... You know, I mean, uh, Hitler thought he was doing right, okay? I mean, so there's, there's not a, I mean, you know, but the idea is if you are, if you can't see a larger view of what's taking place, you get myopic. I didn't say I agree with you. Right, no, no, I'm not saying you personally. I mean, I'm just saying, I, I, I'll think of myself. I, I'll, I can get that way, yeah. you know, which is, uh, for instance, when you, and let's get bigger than just the, the idea of the, the theology in the text. When you go through uh, fight or flight crisis moments, I mean, it, you know physically your body restricts blood flow to a certain part of your brain that deal with that, and so you cannot see what's on the peripheral. I mean, it's, it's true. Right? Don't take my word. Go talk to the doctors, okay? And um, and they'll, they'll, you just you, your body's moving. It's self preservation, okay? Now the good thing is. What's the crisis slows down for you? Have you ever seen those movies, those action movies, where they stop the action and they were running real fast, and all of a sudden it's like slow motion? Well, that takes place for that limited amount that you can see. But what you can't see is all the other stuff going around. Which is why if you uh, people who are in a car wreck or, or, or witness a car wreck, they might recall something a week later because now they're, it, you know, they're, they're getting a lot, they're, it's in there. They've seen it. It's just they're not, you know, their brain's not paying attention to it, and it won't pay attention to it until that fight or flight mentality is released. Does that make sense? And so, uh, um, you know, so, so if, but you can get in situations, even with theology, to where you get so myopic that. It doesn't mean what you're looking at is, is bad. You just, the cost is you're not paying attention to this over here. Now, for instance, if you go back and read everything I've written, uh, whether it be in 
graduates, the different graduate levels and, and whatnot, or even writing, or even to go back and somebody's recording my sermons, and you're just paying attention to theology of shame, you're going to find that my theology is, is heavy Christocentric, which means that the second person of the Trinity is a really, really big deal for me. All right? Now, the negative is that is I can get skewed on issues around that have that theologically speaking line more with the first person of the Trinity or line more with the third person of the Trinity. And so the, the, the discipline for me is to, at least when I'm preaching or planning what I'm going to preach or what I'm going to teach about, is to, you know, I, I'm just, I like stuff that talks about Jesus. So I'm going to focus in on those texts. I, I will shy away naturally from something that doesn't. Because not everything in the Bible talks about Jesus. Some of it talks about the Holy Spirit. Some of it talks about the first person of the Trinity. And, you know, so, so the lesson for me is to go back and read some of this stuff and study it with the same type of vigor and, and time, uh, you know, with, with, you know, I just don't, it's like eating carrots, you know. I, you know, I'll do it, but, you know, I don't want to. You know, I'd rather eat steak or something, you know. Uh, so, uh, but I mean, but, but that's th that, that can happen. Yes, ma'am. Oh, the ten thirty. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, you live in. On one level, it's two different realities, and yet it's the same reality. Now, just sit with me. The two different realities. You live in a local congregation, and you live in a universal church. And so you can talk about it as if they're distinctive. And yet you can talk about them as if they're one. And the key is not to, not to cut one side of it off for the saving of the other. They would be held together. So the great answer, someone says, where do you go to church? Yes. I, you know, do you want the theological long way? You know, St. Paul's a good answer or whatever. I mean, first Baptist or whatever it is, wherever you're in. Uh, you know, but, but, you know, if you're writing a theological statement, I, I, I serve, this is, this is how I, I like to say it, I serve inside of St. Paul, but I belong to the church that's under God. Does that make sense? And so, uh, anyways, all right. Uh, take a break, 10 minutes. All right, before we do, who needs today's slides? Anybody? One, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right, I'm going to get about ten of these. Uh, Fuey. So they call him Fuey in the youth group. And so I didn't know if I'm getting that mixed up. John at few.com. If you will email John, John can email you this list. If you want to consider what's available, uh, different texts along those lines. Um, you know, do spend some time reading the text, and, and if there's something that you can, you know, if, if something speaks to you, uh, for instance, this, this is actually worth the time, so hang on just one, one moment with us. One of the things we talked about in our, if you might remember, we passed out those methods to prayer, they're in those white little booklets, there's a, there's a method of praying, it also is a method of reading the scriptures, uh, Lectio Divinia. And, and it's uh, what the idea is, is, and you've done some of it when you read 1 Corinthians out loud. You take a small portion of text, you read it out loud, and you just read it over and over and over again, maybe three, four, five, however many times you want. And, and as you're reading it, of course, your mind naturally is going to start picking up on some of the words that you're reading. When you get through reading it, the, the discipline in this style of study, this type, style of prayer, is after you read it, you just are silent for a few minutes. And you let your mind bring, you know, God can kind of work in this, you let certain words that you have read will come back to the surface. Not the whole text, but maybe one word, maybe two words, maybe a phrase. And, and the idea, and then, of course, in this in that <coughs> style of praying and study, you focus on that. For instance, if you want to look at what we uh, just talked about before the break, the church of God. We spent 30 minutes talking about that phrase. It's two Greek words. And so, uh, you know, the style around this 
this Lectio Divina type style of study and praying is you read a portion of text. You know, Paul called to be apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. It might be just read it over and over and over. Paul, four or five different times. You might focus in on Jesus Christ. You might focus in on the will of God. You might focus in on an apostle. And so all, all what the discipline or the, the good the goodness of this style of study is whatever it is that's presenting itself that's coming back in, in a form of repetition in your mind, you just focus on that. And you know, so if you're wondering about what to write or can you write or you can. I mean, there's a host of experiences inside this room. You know, the most unfortunate things if they if they never get spoken or written. You know, if there's a way that uh, here is a here is a lie that we believe all the time. I don't care how old you are. I don't care what your experiences are. This, this is common to us all. We believe we don't have a voice, or what our experiences are are either not important or not important or they're just they're isolated we're the only one to experience this that is so not true uh, and, and what happens is i mean think about what happens when you get into a group like this or you get into an accountability group or a you know different types of care groups or supper clubs or whatever but when there's a sense of trust that's created and people then start to talk about their real life you know what you discover it's a great deal the same. <laughs> and see, we think it's just us, you know, and if I say something, then, you know, I'm going to be outed or I'm going to be kicked out or someone's not going to like me the way that they would if they didn't know this stuff. The tr and, and what happens is we walk around faking it, you know, with everybody. Uh, we do, I mean, to some degree. And, and you know, uh, sometimes age teaches us that, gosh, I man, I was not real smart when I was young. I think I was kind of wasting all kinds of energy. And if I'd have just been more authentic, I probably wouldn't have uh, Sometimes age can help us in the maturation process. Sometimes, and I think this is the best way, we don't learn, we don't learn the lesson until we are in a, a good trust relationship. And you realize that you can, you can air what I would call the inside of your stomach, and it's okay. You know, and it, it's... On, on a very small level, you don't even have to sign your name to this, okay? On a very small level, this can begin that process. Because maybe for the first time in your life, it can be anonymous, but you're willing to share about your own experience. That doesn't have to be something that, that you've carried for your, you know, since you've been a little girl or, or whatever. Uh, I mean, it could be something that happened yesterday. But just the idea of you expressing it, um, it's amazing. It's, it's almost like this type of practice is real similar to the power of, of the discipline of confession. Now, confession, we normally think that has to do with negative stuff, so I don't want us to go down that path. But just the idea of confession. The, 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 what happens, the beauty of this, and this is why in some denominations it's, it's a sacrament. It, it, it's... It's amazing how this works. Something you think that is just yours. And it really does control you. It's amazing that when you give just a voice to it, it no longer has that same effect. I, you know, I wish I could give you some wonderful scientific way that that takes place. It, in my simple mind, this is how I see it. When I confess, whether it be to God or to a trusted friend or whatever, it no longer is 100% subjective. It now becomes a portion to where it's objective. And it's out here on the table. Which then I also invite God into the table to deal with it. And it works. Now, I mean, I'm not saying go in and cast your pearls before swine and things, you know, be, be smart, okay? It needs to be in a trust relationship on certain things. But if if you've never ever expressed anything because you feel like you don't have a voice, this is a good place to start. You don't have to sign your name to it. But it, it, will, it will seem, it will be full of anxiety when you're doing it, I promise you, okay? Um, but what you'll find is that when you journey through it 
And even when you put down on paper whatever it is that comes out, you would be surprised how uh, therapeutic that can become. And, and it's it's a it's a it's a real uh, it's amazing how it works. I mean, it, you know, I'm not I don't want to you know beat this thing to death by any stretch. But if you're interested or if you would like to, you can email John or you can pick up. Uh, look at this on the way out. It, it really is a wonderful discipline uh, that that has. You know, it, it's sort of like what we talked about this past Sunday. It's an opportunity for growth. And how unfortunate that we would shy away from the opportunities out of fear. And that's where we where all of us live in some form or fashion. All right. Next thing, today's slides. All right, now I'm gonna pass around today's slides. If, if y'all would keep your hands up and we'll just kind of work it way back that way. Uh, and if you would pass those around. If we need some more, I think I've printed 20 of each. So I think that's a good number for us all. Um, but but that's, uh, that's today's slide. All right. Um, okay. So we, we, uh, we, we, we have this idea where we're living inside of a local congregation, but at the same time we're living inside of a larger church. And, uh, and so we also, uh, so we, we pick up that in verse 1. Um, we, we also look in verse 2. It says, to the church of God, again, that same thing again, the church of God that is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Jesus Christ. Now, go back to what we know about the, the community of Corinth, all right? There are a host of people, let's just say this is the people in the city, and, uh, and so the gospel breaks into people's lives. Uh, they are, you know, they, they are called out. Uh, and so to some degree, the church looks a little bit like this, where it's in the community or in the society or in the world, and yet at the same time, it's not in the world. Probably didn't do it this way. This is a real life processing of a diagram, so we, we might come out good, we might not. Um, it looks more like this. So that, that's kind of like if uh, a diagram of what, what happens. The gospel breaks into the society uh, and, 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 and it, it calls people out according to the text. Uh, the reason why we know that is this word that is used for sanctify. Um, what, what that really is, it's a verb that means to make holy. And um, the, the idea is this is where uh, if, if our theology that leans more towards the third person of the Trinity, this is home cooking there. And one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to sanctify people, to make people holy. Now, what's interesting is that what comes to your mind when we think about holiness or, or holy? Good, oh, someone said it, perfect, right? The idea of perfection, is that really what holiness means? So someone said, I hope not. The newspaper said perfect too, right? So we're, uh, you can't have it both ways, man. You know, uh, so, uh, um, but most of us, when we, when we think about the concept of holiness or to make holy, we do think about the idea of perfection. And that's a good word for it. That's not, that's not a bad word uh, for perfection, but you need to understand biblical understand of what the biblical interpretation for perfection is. Perfection, when it comes to holiness, when it's applied to people, not God, when it's applied to people, is not absolute perfection. Does that make sense? Uh, now it's a verb, it's to make, which means you're in the process of. So the end result might be absolute perfection. But there, there is, uh, again, that contention of I, I am holy, and I'm on my way to being holy, and yet in some degree I'll never be holy. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we're, we're all of that in one. And, uh, and, but 
the role of the Holy Spirit, and this shows up uh, not so much in the book of Corinth. Now, you get a little bit of this when you get into uh, uh, 12, 13, and 14 to some degree, but when you read some of the other epistles, you see, uh, and even into the Gospels, you see the role of the Holy Spirit, which the goal of the Holy Spirit is to take people where they are at and to move them into something that looks like Jesus Christ. Now, the way Wesley described this, and this is a good, uh, Wesley does, he, Wesley capitalizes, now remember, he's, he's a couple centuries after the Reformation, so he's got the luxury of knowing John Calvin's writings and studied that, he knows Luther's writings, and so uh, he comes a little bit after them. And But the way he describes it is, that the way we see holiness inside of our own life is not in terms of absolute perfection as if to say, I get everything right all the time. But to some degree, the intent of our heart and how loving we become. Now let's talk about the first one, the intent of the heart. My anniversary is coming up on February the 18th. See, so if I say it a bunch, I won't forget it. Right? So, uh, um, let's just say, uh, I, I've, I've joked with a friend of mine, I think I told you the story about my friend, but I'll, I'll make it just myself. What if, you know, uh, I want to buy Brooke a whole bunch of new pots and pans? No. Well, no. I, I'm good. No. Well, hang on. Now, my tips in line. You know, she likes to cook. I like to eat. So it's a win-win. No. And, uh, you know, and, and I mean, we, we like eating as a family. We don't always, we try to do it as much as possible. And so one of the ways that we do it is when, when you know, Caroline's our little sous chef, so she cooks with me and cooks with Brooke. Connor just, he just likes to eat. So, I mean, you know, uh, um, but, you know, Oh, you know, it's a good. It's coming from a good place. I love her. I, you know, I know she likes to cook. I know we like to eat together as a family. So, I'm, and I'm hitting on all these cylinders, right? <laughs> so, my intent is right. Is my action going to be right? No. No. See, right. So, theoretically, you can have right intent and have wrong action. Correct. Right. Are you perfect? No. On absolute, no. But morally, I am. Ethically, I am. Go ahead and do that, Jane. Well, no, I'm not going to talk about that for you. Know, I, 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 I've done something stupid like that, so uh, you know, I learned my lesson real quick. Uh, I, 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 we either, I, I don't know if I told you this. I, I, this is kind of a humor story. We won't remember it. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Slade edits this out. Yeah. I'm either feast or famines on our anniversary. I mean, I either, there's no gray area. And, and I, in my mind, I, I just kind of conceive these things to be so wonderful. And from the time of conception to application, you know, I'm either yes or, you know, so um, we're not going to have a Bible study on that one. So. All right, uh, but what you can have is you can have a right intent and, and to be, you know, perfect in heart, correct? And still make a wrong action. Right? Right? What Paul, what Paul, this is now we're getting to a larger scope inside the New Testament. This is what's in line with what it means to be perfect. Okay? So if you want to, if you really want to take to heart the idea of becoming holy, the, the first issue might not be to look at how you make applications inside of, of, of your theology. Maybe the first thing to do is examine the motive. Because the opposite is also true. You can do a right thing and have a wrong motive, and is that perfect? No. And that happens all the time. That's worse. That's, oh, uh, who said that? Me. <laughs> Sally? Yeah. Uh, uh, it, yeah. Well, it can be. So often when that happens, what you see, what the heart reveals, is the problem inside of the first four chapters. It has to deal with self-rule and self-authority. Think about it. We're not going to throw stones. Or when you see it happen inside of your family or society or wherever it may be, where somebody does something that might be good, but they're doing it for a wrong reason, 99.9% .9 of the time...
I want to get a goodie out of this for myself. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right, selfish mode. And so, uh, you know, I, in the end, I'll take it because it's still good. But I mean, you know, we're talking about perfection, right? And so, but what we what we discover in the New Testament is um, that to be made perfect or to be made holy as a verb has a number of dynamics involved with it. One is that there's this sinner saint type uh, contention that's going on where we know that, that there are parts of our heart that are growing more like Jesus and yet at the same time we know that there are parts of our heart that are not. We know that sometimes that, that when it gets played out inside of society, it, 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 it hits the mark so the heart and the action is right. Sometimes we know that the heart's right and the action's wrong. Sometimes we know the heart's wrong and the action's right. All that's going on inside of all of us. Now the Holy Spirit's role throughout the maturation process of faith. Now again, now this, is a, this is a bigger issue, but it's very, very important that we understand this. What's hot-wired into the Christian experience is we are to grow. Faith is not a stagnant or a one-time or a solo type event. Now, the introduction into the kingdom might be a solo event. But what's written into the whole dynamics of, of, of what it means to be a Christ follower, a Christian, whatever term you want to put to it, is this idea of maturation. We are to grow more and more like Christ. And the Holy Spirit's role is to work to get where the heart and the action are the same. And when that happens, there will be absolute perfection. But until then, we're kind of operating in this little triad of stuff where one's right, one's wrong, one's wrong, the other one's right, or both are wrong. Or both are right. Ma'am? Right. And, and, you know, and what I've discovered, at least inside my own self, um, there's, you know, if we want to talk about it in terms of, uh, you know, I, I love, I think the church's work on the seven deadly sins are some of the best work in, in helping people understand this growth process. If you just want to talk about it on, you know, the seven, seven, seven deadly sins. Uh, and if you boil down all sin, whatever that may be, if you had a laundry list of a hundred, they're probably going to be boiled down to one of these, the one that hurts. They're, they're not after just the symptom. They're after the problem. And so the heart gives you indication of where the problem starts. Nobody acts inconsistent to what no one that well. Nobody acts inconsistent <coughs> to what has been conceived inside first. It is what it is. We, we just are real good at faking it. And it happens all the time. And I mean, we, we, there are some times where somebody does something inside the world or, or, or in our life or in the community or whatever, and it's not a shock. And you, and you can peg it right off the bat. Oh yeah, this is, I know this is not new. It might be new for everybody else, but I, I, I saw this. You know, I can make that conclusion. Or there are all these times where we are shocked. The, the, the issue is just we just didn't we didn't have insight into what was going on inside of them. But you know, Bible's real clear. You see it in James. Uh, you see it in um, you definitely see it in Revelation. Uh, you see it in the Gospels. What goes on inside? You, you know, we will talk about in terms of heart. Now, we, that's the seed of identity. That's the seed of your influence. I don't mean your you know your physical heart. Uh, in the Old Testament, it was your bowels and your gut. And, and, uh, um, but the idea is, whatever it is, that part inside of you that determines who you are, right? that is where you need to start. What, what was that? Oh, you, can't, you said you couldn't hear I can't hear the word. I used to say when you know in your knower. Yeah, exactly right. Good, good word, your knower. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Um, and we all got that. It's going to be, it's, you know, and it'll be different for each person, which means, you know, what, what is easy for you might be hard for me. What is easy for me might be harder for you or might be a greater source of, of temptation. But the, the way we process out of that with the Holy Spirit 
is not go to the end reaction or, or the end effect of it, the action that we've committed. Go back to the first part of it. Coming up in February, we're going to, um, I preached a sermon, that, I don't know, at some point on anger. And we're going, to, we're going to go back and look at that, and then we're going, to, we're going to add about three more sermons to it coming up in February. And, you know, uh, the, the issue behind I me, mean, anger is nothing more than just a symptom of what's going on inside. And see, but what happens is whenever we act out in, in, in anger or someone else acts out, we want to focus in on what that actual acting out was. Okay? I said something, not, you know, or I did something not excusable. But you can fix that and still be a, you know, still have a problem. The real goal is to get behind the root of it. Let's find the source of the Nile. You know, let's not go to where, where all the water is flowing. Let's go back to the beginning. And so what the role of the Holy Spirit is always to push us back to the beginning of what will eventually lead to either a right action or, or a wrong action. Which is when you read in the New Testament and Jesus... Uh, I don't know if you remember this, but if you go back to Mark 7, Mark 7 is one of the greatest chapters in the, in the book of Mark, where he is changing the paradigm for people's understanding about where this starts. They want to talk about washing their hands correctly. You don't wash yourself hands right. You're not washing the pots right. You're doing, you're serving the sacraments wrong. You're not washing it right. You're not saying the right words. And Jesus says, that's not real, that's important. But the real issue is what's behind it. And that's when he talks about you can eat whatever you want. And if you know something about the body, you eat it, it bypasses the heart, and then it goes out your it goes out your body. And it has nothing to do with what you take in. If you want to know what the real issue is for you, what comes out? Because that's where it's already starting in here. Does that make sense? And so, you know, this is this is uh, so Paul. Again, now we could, you know, if this was like an, if, if, the, if First Corinthians was like an, uh, one of those little devices, and we touch that, you know, where it says this idea of being sanctified, you could pull up all the different laundry lists that they're going through because they apply, you know, they're they're fighting over authority. Well, that's because they're, you know, there's things like greed, there's things like lust for stuff, and you know, they're, they're, they're you know, that's an issue. There's all kinds of sexual uh, problems going on. Well, I mean, you know, that's a different issue. There, you know, there's, there's issues around uh, when, they, when we get into chapter 6 and they start taking each other to court. I don't mean like uh, something huge. Uh, this is where, you know, I get up and, um, you know, somebody drives their car two feet on my driveway and they leave a mud mark. And so instead of, you know, going to say, hey, I, you know, so I really don't appreciate you doing that. Could you help me clean that up? I don't even go talk to her. I just immediately go down to the court and file papers. <clears throat> That's what's going on in the text. And so what, what might be the heart issue behind that is I'm, I'm not going to let anybody pull one over on me. Does that make sense? I mean, you know, we're, you know we don't, I'm, I'm making a speculation. Uh, but, I mean, why is it that... Uh, um, are you familiar? You ever heard me talk about the the uh, the ability to lay something down? Uh, y some of y'all said y'all play cards. What kind of card games you play? Bridge. All right, you got to pick a game. I know. So, uh, <laughs> uh, how do you win in bridge? Oh, old maid. Old maid. I understand old maid. Okay. Uh, well, old maid, you got to lie to win. I mean, so we don't want to play that one. Uh, um, hearts. Hearts. Okay, I understand hearts. Or spades, you know, hearts. You gotta, you want to get your number, and, and so uh, when you can throw off a card, uh, and you need to throw it off, you don't start with, you know, if you want to get rid of all your spades or all your your your, your royal cards, uh, and somebody throws down, and you don't have that suit, you're quickly laying off those high dollar cards, right? Because you don't want them. Uh, it, it, you know, um, and the idea is maybe what you might do is. You might take one for the team or your partner, if you're playing with partners, so that down the road y'all can get more points than just that immediate set or that immediate card, that one, the one deal that you just had. Um, if you play poker, um, you'll fold a few hands 
before you, you know, instead of just winning every one of them, you might fold a few in order to get something bigger down the road. That's what we mean by laying something down. And so when, when we now when we make application to our faith and we make application to our life, you don't have to defend everything. Does that make sense? Um, who cares if somebody says something about you? Just because they say it, does that mean it's true? I mean, think about it. That's what we're trying to teach my children right now. That's my daughter. Connor said this. I said, honey, does that make you who you are? No. We, we struggle with that, don't we? Yeah. You know? And so, uh, or, or even if somebody says something uh, about God, you ever feel like you got to defend God? All the time, don't we? I mean, do we really need to? I mean, I, I one of the biggest like lessons, I, I felt my job, I don't know where I got this from, I, you know, I guess when I was studying to be a minister, my job was to prove all the wrongs about what people say about God. And, you know, about the first five years of my ministry, oh, I probably was terrible. And uh, and then one day, I was way ahead, and, and I promise you, this is how I perceived it. Son, I've been doing this a lot longer than you have. I can take care of myself. I kid you not, that's exactly what I took away from the prayer time. And, uh, and then all of a sudden I realized, you know what, you're absolutely right. I don't have to defend, you know, the truth is, we can't control anybody. And we, I mean, you can't control God. Um, and it just makes you really <clears throat> not like the person who said it. Well, but that, now, hang on, let's stay, that's a good, thank you very much. Um, when, when that happens, what don't you like? I don't like his rudeness and his okay. right. he's talking about my God. Let's, let's flesh this out. We're not talking about you specifically. We're just talking about things in general. Is it, is it really the person that said it or the rudeness? Or is it that we feel like what they said has harmed us or hurt us? Um, but even if someone's rude, what is that to you? Really nothing. Except right, well, 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 hang on. It really is nothing. Seriously, think about it. Now, we don't like it. We want, to be, we don't want our society to be a rude society. Now, and if you're teaching someone where you've got some influence over it, that's a completely different topic. But, if, you know, if, uh, if someone says something and, and it's a rude comment, what does that tell you? Does that, does that say something about you or does that say something about them? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, but what we do is we want to take ownership of, of that person and what was said. And jerk them out of Sure. Well, that's right. Okay. But so, so jerk them out. Right. So what happens is somebody says something. What goes on inside of us is the jerking of the knot. Is the jerking of the knot because I didn't like it and you fired yeah. one across my bow? All right? Okay, now what's that tell you about yourself? You're angry. A little bit of anger. All right, why are you angry? Somebody got the best of you? Maybe you feel that they, because they are rude, how dare they? I'm not, I'm not, you know, let's just kind of do a lot of this. Maybe, maybe we feel they're beneath us and yet they pulled one over us. And so we feel like our um, that our status or esteem or, or, or who we are has been hurt or lessened. None of those are true. Maybe we feel like we're the last word. Okay, bingo, now you're going. So then we gotta feel, why do we feel like we have to have the last word? Well, okay, you got to the right, right? Well, hang on. Um, part of it is you might know that you're right. Part of it is getting the last word has more about dominating somebody else. Okay? Well, let's just say that's not us, and we're going to focus in on the right stuff, all right? That we're right. If it's right, it's self-authenticated. The truth will be self... The truth is the truth regardless, right? I mean, think about it. It's self-authenticated. And so, if it is that you're right, or if it is, if it is the truth, then it's going to come out regardless. Normally, does it not happen? Might take some time, okay? But it comes out, and so whether 
whether we respond or not has nothing to do with the truth. Correct? Correct. Most of the time, and let's just be honest, I'm not there with you, okay? Most of the time, when somebody does something, my feathers are ruffled. My feelings are hurt. Okay, that's fine. But what happens? I've got to go and defend myself. Which is, you know, now, that doesn't mean that, you know, feelings are hurt. That's another issue altogether. All Why is it my feelings are hurt? Okay, because they, what they said were hurtful. And I trusted them, and I loved them, and they said something that was different. That, okay, there's nothing wrong with that. That's real. But, you know, do we then deal with why that hurt us? And then maybe our action then might be to let's work towards a, a just resolution or some reconciliation or some forgiveness have to take place. That's a totally different way of action than how dare you say that about me? You hurt my feelings. Now ball up your fist because here I come. Does that make sense? Those are two different responses. And so, you know, uh, what I'm not advocating is that you should be like Superman or Superwoman and never feel anything and, and keep people at arm's distance. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm saying is just that what is very helpful to us in any situation, whether they be incredibly uh, positive and joyful and celebratory or whether they be just the bottom of, of the valley, we first want to ask the question about the inside of us, why? Why is a great question to ask yourself. It's a terrible question to ask somebody else. Because it puts them, it, it comes across as accusing. I, I, I see it a little bit different because when some, you know, I, I hear a lot of people say, I don't really like religion or church, but I am very spiritual. Okay. And I think, <laughs> That's the only place I get spiritual is if I'm in the church. I don't get to float away often when I think about things. And but so but I hear when I hear you know what do you, if I don't say anything, I hear I see Peter denying his religion, or you you know oh there's that Christian that was with Jesus. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. You know, and they they win the argument right there. So I, I don't particularly like to give in with this idea that. I don't need to speak up about it. Okay, well, that's what that's telling you is a lot about slave. Yeah, Okay. I think All so. Right. You, you asked the question. <laughs> hang on. I'm not, no, I'm yeah, not I, know it, this, I know exactly where it's coming from. Yeah. We're, not, we're not highlighting anybody yeah. or anything. So, slave makes the comment. I hear all the time, people say I'm spiritual, but I'm not churched, or I don't go to church, or I'm, I don't know, what was the other? Something like I don't, I don't, not much on religion. I don't like to go to church. Um, actually, that's... That can be a very true statement. We all are spiritual. Whether you want to admit it or not, you say, okay, yeah, so am I. Okay. But then, then the question really is, what, what are they getting at? The question is, I, don't, I want to find a reason to not have to do this or to not go. Okay? And so the conversation is not to where you have to argue or defend. It's to... Uh, whenever you have a debate, the first thing you do is clarify terms. What are you really saying? You're saying, it could be that you have a critique about the church is very real. I don't want to go to the church. The church has been very hurtful to me. That happens. It's okay. All right? well, at least we know what we're talking about. The next issue might be, well, I, you know, what I really want to do is just sleep late on Sundays. Hey, okay, that's fine too. All right? But not, now we at least know what we're talking about. But see, what happens is, Somebody says something that are token words or lightning rod words or whatever it may be, and they might be saying something up here. We're hearing something down here. And so then when we begin to have a conversation, we're moving in opposite directions. And so then we normally have to feel like we have to start dominating them. Now we're talking about personal dynamics more than anything else here. But, uh, you know, um, the, the real issue is to get to... You know, get to what the real, what the conversation really is about. Okay, why? You know, yeah, you know what? I'm, I'm a spiritual person, but I like to go to church because I've, I've discovered that when I'm in church, I find that my sensitivity towards things that are spiritual becomes very heightened. Fair worship, prayer, chapel, things like those things, study, right? So someone could say, okay, yeah, I can do that when I'm out on the golf course. The field at the beach, you know, wherever. It's okay, that's good. I can too. But maybe, maybe there is something that is 
there's there, maybe this is a hot spot that is more than this over here. Yeah, uh, but but then again, all of this is uh, you know, the best thing we can do as evangelists, and you all are, is um, let's just let's just have conversations so that the doors open, so that at least at some point they can come back. Because if we feel that the overwhelming desire is I've got to defend or I've got to one up or I've got to correct their behavior, things of that nature, what we're after, nine times out of ten, is an immediate response at the end of our conversation that will change their behavior. It will not. Seldom does it. Uh, which is why, um, you know, you've heard people say Billy Graham preached a gazillion sermons, he lived one. You know, what's, what's the lesson behind that? And so what we're, what we're after when it comes to being evangelists is not a quick fix. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. And so, you know, and if we're asking, say, you know, this is our heart. M-G-A-R-T. If we're asking uh, things about our heart, what we're after is a picture of our life that looks like Jesus Christ. And the verb that is used in the text, and it's a verb, it's not a noun. Not even, I mean, that, that's that's what it is. It's a verb, and so it's active, and it is to it's the Holy Spirit's actions to make you to make me holy. And so we, the way we see that is sanctification. So you have the word sanctified. You're called by God. You belong to His church. It can be in a local setting, but it's also at the same time, it's a church that sits under Him. And even though you live in a world that does not reflect God, and there are times even inside the church it does not reflect God, we're still called to be holy. Which is why He also calls us saints. And at the same time we are, and on one level we're not. And so that's what you find in these first three verses. In, in the you find a church that lives in a world that has got all kinds of problems, just like we do. And there is a gospel that breaks into these people's lives, and it, 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 it calls them out of that life. Now, they're still there. They don't disappear. But it calls them into a kingdom to live and to reflect the king. And it takes time. But the purpose of the Holy Spirit is so that you would grow into His likeness. And it never stops with that desire. And we might not respond to it. Because God doesn't violate our will. But it will never stop trying to create Jesus Christ inside of all of us. Does that make sense? This is a great few verses. Uh, you, you, you belong to the church of God. Uh, and you're called to be holy. Which means that uh, the word there is saint. So even though that's a struggle for us, when you walk out of here, you have to tell yourself, yeah, I am. I'm in the process of that. And God is, is rewriting my DNA on the inside so that, my, so that I'll function and act and believe and love the way He does. Alright? Any questions? Go in peace. Go in peace. That was good.